Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, really excited to be here. And um, it's an honor, as, as always. Uh, my talk is titled Closure on the Cyberpunk Frontier of Democracy. And uh, my name is Christopher Small. So this is a story in part about my very first Closure application. So this is kind of how I got into Closure. And um, some things I'd like to touch on on that note are why I chose Closure for this application, what my experience with Closure has been like uh, over the course of its development. And uh, kind of finally, I'd like to make a case for Closure as a language for doing data science. But this is also part of a story of sort of a, a new way of thinking about democracy, at least a potentially new way of thinking about democracy. And it's sort of a computational way of thinking about democracy. Uh, so I hope that there will be some kind of interesting, uh, broader spectrum thought along those lines that I'll be able to share. So uh, no closure talk will be complete without the obligatory uh, etymology slides. So uh, to get that out of the way, um, the word democracy itself comes from the words demos and kratos, uh, which, which translate to roughly to the common people and to strength, uh, respectively. So we can then kind of think about democracy as this idea of strength together, right? We're stronger together than we are apart. But I think it's important to note that democratic behavior is nothing new. Um, it, it's actually ancient. We can observe democratic-like behavior uh, kind of across uh, various species boundaries. Um, so non-human primates will exhibit certain kinds of democratic behavior. Wolves hunting will exhibit, exhibit certain kinds of dem democratic behavior in terms of deciding when they're going to go out to hunt. Um, bees exhibit uh, democratic behavior when they decide where to go build a new colony or where to go forage for, uh, for pollen uh, and nectar. Um, but we often talk about democracy as having been invented or discovered by, uh, by the Greek. And I think the reason for this is that really that they were the first to systematize democracy in sort of a, you know, a well-formalized a well -formalized way. And when I say systematize, this is actually what I mean. So this is a, this is a diagram which represents the, the structure of Athenian democracy from you know, 500 BC. Um, and you'd be sort of forgiven for you know, taking off your glasses and looking at this and think you were looking at a UML diagram, right? Um, and what I think this highlights is that democracy really is a technology. Uh, it's an information processing technology, right? We have people at the, um, the center of this diagram here. Uh, the, the circle is the citizenry of, of Athens. And all these lines sort of going out in different directions represent the various governing bodies within uh, Athenian democracy. And, and what's interesting is that a lot of these governing bodies were actually fed through sortition or through random sampling, effectively, right? So they believed that wanting power in Athenian, in Athenian democracy was actually disqualifying for the position of power. And so uh, a, a lot of Athenian democracy was based on random lot, um, random sampling. Um, and, and so what, what I think is really interesting about this is while this is an information processing and aggregation system, it's actually built out of people, right? This is built out of institutions of people who, who, are, who are collecting opinions and, and sentiment and sort of processing that into, into decision-making apparatus. But I think it's important to note that there are fun, fundamental limitations to this. And, and the, the Athenians sort of recognized this and, and thought that you really couldn't scale democracy beyond the scope of the city-state. Um, they, they, their, their sort of framing of the problem was that if you were just bound by how many people you could get in a room physically or in a, in a coliseum uh, in order to actually make these decisions together. Um, but aside from that, that sort of uh, kind of physical constraint, there was also the constraint of different city-states having too many potentially different uh, interests and, and, and the challenge of getting two different city-states with such different interests together to make, uh, to make decisions together would potentially be just too challenging. And so at this sort of scale of things, they thought that the best you could do is have sort of a loose federation of city-states. So this all sort of raises the question, what would democracy look like if we invented it today? If democracy is a technology and bound by all these sort of constraints of, of computation, uh, then what would it look like today? So I think it's helpful uh, when asking this question to sort of take a step back and talk about cybernetics. Um, and in part, this is sort of a hat tip to the title of the talk, right? But um, the word, uh, and this is also uh, our bonus etymology slide here. So the word cybernetics comes from the Greek word for governance, quite literally. Um, there's sort of some various variations of the word which translates something more along the lines of helmsman or ship steerer. 
um, which kind of gives you a sense for how they thought about, uh, about this word and what it meant. But um, when we talk about cybernetics in the modern sense, uh, we can go back to its first English definition, which was by uh, Norbert Wiener and was defined as the scientific study of control and communication in the animal and the machine. Um, so the two words to really pay attention to here are control and communication, right? And one way of sort of boiling this down is that cybernetics at its core is really about any system that has feedback or signal uh, which then is processed and influences behavior of the system. So this is actually extremely broad and it's so broad as to almost become meaningless, right? So uh, one can make the argument that it's sort of generalized abstract nonsense uh, as a result. And indeed, I think for a long time, before I really got deeply into um, cybernetics and, uh, and really started kind of digging into the history, that was sort of my impression of what cybernetics was, right? It's this word that sort of sounds like something out of science fiction and, um, you know, what is that really anyway? But when you start to dig deeper, you realize there's really a rich history here. And cybernetics has influenced many, many fields from artificial intelligence to robotics, the internet, aka anything cyber star, um, sociology, ecology, psychology, I mean, the list goes on and on. If you go to the Wikipedia page for, for uh, cybernetics, you'll see that there's just a wealth of, of different subjects that it has touched on. Um, and I think the value here is that in looking at things this kind of abstractly, we start to see these bigger system, or sorry, bigger, bigger picture patterns in the way that systems behave. And one of, the, uh, one of the concepts that we can get from this, which I think is, is really potentially valuable, is the idea of a signal problem. Um, the challenge of, 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 um, of signals getting enough information into a system to make good decisions. So the first part of this here is that right, it's difficult to gather and synth synthesize information from lots of people, but it's also difficult to come to an agreement when different signals are pointing in different directions. So these are sort of the two fundamental signal problems of democracy and governance. This brings us to Polis. Um, so as I mentioned here in the slides, but uh, forgot to actually state, um, Polis uh, comes from the Greek word for city-state. And so um, we name this sort of in hearkening back to the, the roots of democracy as we know it. Uh, but really what the tool Polis that we built is all about is scalable open-ended feedback. Um, so this is, this is that feedback side of the, the sort of cybernetic process here. Now one way to think about what this is really aiming to do is to look at social media. Social media has made it possible for you know, millions, billions of people to speak all at once. Uh, and, and this is just phenomenal, right? I and mean, this is, you know, if the Athenians had seen what we're able to do with Twitter or with, with Facebook, they would have, um, you know, they might, they might have seen things very differently. But um, the problem is that unless you're a data scientist, you have no hope of being able to listen at this scale, you know? Unless you're able to plug into the Twitter firehose and run a bunch of processing algorithms to sort of build some picture of what people are thinking and saying, you have no hope of being able to understand that big picture. Um, and this is a real challenge, right? If you believe that the democracy depends on feedback of sort of information processing from the people, um, this sort of lack of coherence is, is a real challenge uh, for a functioning democracy. So the question then is, uh, how can we use data science to make the opinion landscape transparent to everyone? And so not just to data scientists who, who, can, who can use these methods or to the people who can afford to hire them, but really to everyone. How do we democratize these methods, uh, machine learning, et cetera, and, and turn it into something that the entire society can benefit from? What this actually looks like in practice uh, is a participation experience where someone can ask an open-ended question. So this might be something like, what do you think about football injuries in, in uh, that is to say, what do you think about brain injury in football? Or what do you think about gun control? Um, could be anything, right? It could be very broad. People respond with statements expressing how they think or feel about the subject. And then they get the chance to vote on statements that have been submitted by others. What we get from this now is based on all these votes, we can put together this vote matrix where we have people along the rows and where columns correspond to the comments in, or statements in the conversation. This by itself is not really particularly useful. We haven't really learned anything yet. Um, but where we start to 
really glean some meaning is where we start doing dimensionality reduction. Okay, so the, the problem with this giant vote matrix is that you have a bunch of points in this really high dimensional space, and that's really sort of difficult to visualize. We're, we're, we're pretty good at looking at two dimensional spaces and you know, reasonably good at looking at three dimensional spaces, although it can be a little challenging for computers sometimes. Um, but anything beyond that, and we really start to have uh, a breakdown in, in our ability to comprehend. So the first step here is just to reduce the dimensionality of this data. Uh, and the method that we use to do that is a method called principal components analysis. So if you're familiar, to your, so excuse me, if you're familiar with um, dimensionality reduction, principal components analysis is a very sort of vanilla standard method for doing this. And effectively what it does is you take this high dimensional space and you sort of rotate it around until you're able to capture the highest variance. Um, and you could sort of imagine um, there's an there's a analogy where you sort of think about a star field. Um, like a spiral galaxy or something. And what you want to do is create a map of that galaxy. Uh, well, you wouldn't take the Milky Way galaxy and sort of flip it on its side like a dinner plate because you're going to be missing a lot of the variance within, within the galaxy if you do that. Uh, what you want to do is sort of rotate it around until you really see the full spiral. And now you've got a good map, right? Um, so this is exactly what PCA does. It's just literally doing rotations in space until you come up with some lower dimensional representation that captures as much of the data as you can. So because we're looking at opinion data here, uh, we can sort of think about this now as like an opinion map or an opinion landscape. And this sort of leads us to the next stage of our processing, which is clustering. So once you have an opinion landscape and a bunch of people uh, represented within this landscape, you can cluster them into opinion groups. Uh, so each of these opinion groups then represents some sort of collection of opinions which tend to sort of go together. But that's not the end of it. Um, where opinion groups really become interesting is where you start to dig in and figure out what's important to each opinion group. Um, and and this, is, uh, this is really interesting in that it's, it's one of the real challenges when we look socially at, at what happens on the web, right? When you're on Twitter and you see someone um, from one camp say something outrageous and, uh, and, and, the and the folks on the other side sort of use it and hold it up and say, aha, look, the other guys, they're evil, right? Look at this ridiculous thing that they said. Well, that might not really be that representative of what that group really truly thinks and feels and really what just sort of distinguishes them from, quote unquote, the other side. Um, and this is, um, this is uh, this, this, this first step of just understanding what's actually important to each group is, is really key to building a sense of meaning and understanding of, of not only what your group feels and thinks, but what the other group feels and thinks. Um, where, where you're sort of able to tone down uh, the fringes. But that's really just the first step. Uh, because once you understand groups, what you want to do is start to look for consensus between them. Uh, and, and this is where the real magic lies in Polis, is that once you're able to break down the discussion into opinion groups, you're able to look for where there's unexpected commonality between those groups. And that's often something that's very enlightening and sort of paves the way for pushing forward in decision making um, in, in a way that's very challenging without doing this. So what this actually looks like as far as the participation experience, um, we have a data visualization which shows uh, each of these little sort of circles here is someone's position in the opinion landscape. Um, and these are you know, Twitter or Facebook profile images. And um, you can explore this. You can click around. If you click on a group, you can see what's important to that group. Uh, and there are also some UI components which aren't shown here which lets you see those consensus comments. And again, I really just want to highlight that the, the real secret sauce here is consensus, um, because this is what brings coherence to a, to a discussion, um, and, and, and what lets you see that uh, oftentimes there, there are pieces of um, their ideas or thoughts that, that actually bring us together more than our sort of tribal social instincts would, would have us believe. So as sort of a case in point of where this has been used, I'm going to tell you a little story about um, Taiwan. So in 2014, Taiwan stuck a trade, struck a trade deal with China. Uh, and it, it just had abysmal national support. Um, no one really liked this thing. And part of the problem was that it had not gone through sort of the standard review process where people could sort of comment, et cetera. And part of the issue here is that Taiwan sees itself as an independent nation, while China views it as, views it as sort of a rogue province. And um, this worried people 
that this was sort of a step towards uh, you know, a slippery slope of being sort of reintegrated into China, um, which truly really concerned a lot of people in the country. So they saw this as a failure of democracy. And what resulted from this was a set of Occupy-style protests where they occupied parliament building and they, um, they occupied the streets outside. And uh, all of these old school facilitators were able to come up and in the streets with, with giant poster boards and sticky notes, uh, applying these old school facilitation methods, sort of from the ground up, building, uh, building ideas about how they could resolve these issues. And they were actually able to work out a more agreeable trade deal and get the government to agree to it. Um, so this was sort of phenomenally su successful. Um, of all the sort of Occupy movements that have happened, this, this was, I think, one of the few that's really had some sort of tangible positive outcomes. And once, once they got there, everyone went home and everything was, everything was great. Um, but one of the key sort of points here was that in this whole process, this, uh, this civic tech group called GovZero, um, G0V here, um, came, to, came to favor with the population for the role that they played in these protests. Uh, they were wiring Ethernet out into the streets and like setting up makeshift Wi-Fi antennas uh, with tin cans and stuff and um, making sure that everything was transparent. They were recording everything and broadcasting it. <clears throat> and what this meant was that no one could say, oh, they're going and tearing things up or they're you know, misbehaving. Everything was transparent. And so no one could sort of cast uh, a false narrative about what was going on in these protests. Unfortunately, though, the government was sort of suffering a crisis of confidence in the wake of, um, uh, of this event and what had happened. And in response to this, uh, the, the then minister of, um, digital, digital minister of uh, Taiwan, Jacqueline Tsai, went to a GovZero hackathon. I mean, you can imagine like some notable like, rep uh, politician go, coming to like a closure hackathon and asking people to help out. This is sort of paints the picture, right? Um, she came to a Gov, GovZero hackathon and challenged them to build a platform uh, which the entire nation could participate in um, in order to deliberate issues of national importance. And the response to this was a tool called, uh, and not really a tool, more of a, um, a platform or suite of tools called vTaiwan. Um, and there's a number of tools that sort of fit into vTaiwan and it's sort of an open-ended process that depending on the details can go in different ways and use different Different, um, different methods, but uh, the, the part of vTaiwan which sort of fulfills this goal of having, you know, having a platform that the entire nation can deliberate uh, within is, is the Polis tool that we built. Um, and so it sort of sits, sits at the, the early phase of, of the vTaiwan process where they want to get large scale open data and feedback from large groups of people. Um, so this has been really successful. Um, they've used this to regulate, to figure out how, they, how to regulate Uber and Airbnb, which of course is really interesting because uh, this has been a real challenge for a lot of countries, figuring out what to do with this sort of new technology. And um, it's also helped them break through issues on which they've been in gridlock for, for years. Uh, one particular case here is um, this issue over online alcohol sales in Taiwan is something that uh, the nation had been debating and been in gridlock over uh, for, for I think four years, four or five years. And within a few months, uh, using this sort of open process, they were able to actually build from the ground up uh, a, a, set of, um, a set of positions which helped sort of stake out uh, uh, you know, a direction that they could, they could build in in policy. Um, and what I think this shows is that when you sort of take out all of the political maneuverings and uh, backroom dealings and horse trading, et cetera, um, there are actually pieces of, um, of the kind of collective conscious that can bring different groups, different sides of an issue together. Uh, and, and, and really what happened here was there were specific statements from either side that sort of gave a little room and said, well, maybe if there was this kind of regulation in place or maybe if there was this sort of need being addressed, we'd feel more comfortable about it. And that was what sort of helped them push through to, uh, to a proposal which had really broad support. Um, and again, this was something that, that the politicians in the traditional um, you know, representative establishment was not able to break through for, for a number of reasons. And I can talk about that later if, if folks have questions. But, um, but this is really cool, right? So closure and polis are being used now to make decisions of national importance in, in this country, Taiwan. 
So if you're interested in reading more about this, um, I'd recommend, um, there's, there's a number of articles that have been published on this now. There's, we have a Wired article, which is great, um, and some stuff in the MIT Tech Review. Um, but uh, really the first English language publication about all this, right, because this happened over on the other side of the planet, we're big in Taiwan, um, and uh, no one here knew about it, right, unless you spoke Cantonese, this was like, this was, this was, this was something that no one knew about. Um, but Liz Berry, um, this really wonderful individual um, who uh, I think actually is from North Carolina here, and um, she, she found out about this and actually went over there and was interviewing people and, and wrote this English uh, article, which which then has been kind of a keystone for us in terms of other people in the English-speaking world finding out about it. And um, since then, um, we, you know, we've, we've started to work in Canada and Singapore, and um, we're doing some stuff with uh, local, local newspapers in the United States, and, um, and uh, also within companies, and um, are really you know, making some great headway. So, um, so if you're interested in reading more, I'd recommend checking that out. But uh, so far, I haven't really talked about Clojure yet. And uh, you're all maybe wondering, what am I doing here? Is this supposed to be a Clojure conference? So, um, so I'm going to switch tracks here a little bit and, and talk about that. So the initial implementation of the math engine behind Polis uh, was written just as a little R script, right? Um, this very simple little thing that we ran in a loop. And this was fine as a proof of concept. It worked. Uh, but we knew that it wouldn't be scalable as the system grew. And as we wanted to do more kind of in-depth analysis, you know, we knew that we'd, we'd um, we'd have a harder time kind of working with the data in this paradigm. So um, a, a couple years before this point, I had started getting into functional programming and just kind of as a side hobby thing. And it was sort of felt good for the brain, like I was learning a lot. Um, and in particular, I'd, I, started, I had started using Haskell. And I really loved it. Um, it sort of tickled the, the math part of my brain. Um, and uh, I, I was really interested in thinking about, you know, could, is this something we could use for, for building the math engine behind this? But I wasn't really sure if it, this would be a good fit for doing this kind of work. Um, in particular, I wasn't sure if the, you know, we'd have performance issues or you know, are we going to get looked at crazy and not be able to get funding or that sort of, that sort of thing. Um, but one of the things which sort of tipped, um, tipped, the, tipped the scales towards me sort of more seriously considering this direction was an article that I read uh, called The Downfall of Imperative Programming. And, um, the, the, the line here which stuck out to me was concurrency and parallelism are the killer app for functional programming. <clears throat> so this was a really compelling idea. Um, the, the, the basics of which were just that uh, immutable data eliminates this entire class of, of issues associated with concurrency and parallelism. And we saw that this would potentially be a win for an application that's going to be dealing with a lot of data and that we want to be sort of responding in real time. and. Um, and, and so we, we started to sort of give it more serious consideration. We also thought about a number of other um, functional programming languages, um, Scala, OCaml. Um, but for a number of reasons, we sort of converged on Clojure. And uh, I think w one of the big ones was that, again, because we were sort of thinking about this as, you know, how can we utilize concurrency and parallelism, um, we recognized that Clojure was built right, with one of sort of its primary um, motivations as a language for tackling the challenges of concurrency and parallelism. And so that really appealed to us. But another feature is that uh, we saw that being hosted on the JVM, we'd have the reach of deployment of the JVM, uh, and we'd have the richness of all the libraries and sort of ecosystem pieces that, that we have available in the JVM. Uh, and in particular, right, the JVM had all of these great like big data processing libraries, Hadoop and uh, Spark and, and all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, we really saw that that was a strength of the JVM ecosystem and that using Clojure's interop, we'd be able to take advantage of that. <coughs> but really one of the most important pieces was just that it was fun. Um, learning Clojure was really fun in a way that, I mean, I, again, I, I really liked Haskell, but there was sort of this sense of austerity with it, right, where, you know, you get in and you sort of have to fight with the compiler until it compiles, and usually it works, but, um, but there's something just really fun about working with Clojure. It had the feel of, of, of Ruby or Python, um, but had all this great functional stuff, too. And, and that really appealed to me, and especially when you're building a project as a side project, a passion project, you know, when, you, when you've been spending eight hours working uh, at your day job and come home and want to spend a couple hours on a side project, you actually want to look forward to it, right? You don't want to be sort of dreading cranking out more code in a language that's, that's, um, uh, that's not, your, not, not, not really hitting it for you on that side. Um, so the question is, how did this work out? That's the theory, right? 
great. <laughs> Obviously, I wouldn't be here talking about this if, uh, if this hadn't gone well. Um, but to dig into this a little more, um, I, I think one thing that I didn't see as clearly heading into the Clojure ecosystem that really quickly began to, um, I began to appreciate more deeply, <coughs> and which um, I think still I start to see more and more deeply the more I use Clojure, is this idea of data-driven programming. Um, and I think this is something that really sets closure apart in the functional programming world, is this sort of focus on programming with data. Um, and one sort of look at this is that it's sort of the Lisp philosophy taken to the next level, right? So more sort of dynamic take on the Lisp philosophy. Um, there's also libraries like uh, Prismatic Plumbing. This is just sort of a little example here, right, that, was, that were really useful to us and allowed us to specify uh, the structure of a computation separate from its execution. So we could write the... Uh, the express the computation is this data structure which we can then actually modify and mutate, uh, not mutate, but um, you know, uh, compose and, and sort of build up in different ways, and then um, specify how it's going to be executed, whether it's going to be lazily executed or greedily executed or executed in parallel or executed in parallel with profiling, et cetera. Um, and, and that was really nice uh, and, and, and felt very powerful. But kind of at a really base fundamental level, I think what, what stood out was that data science really naturally benefits from this kind of dynamic data centrism. You know, if you're working with data and that's kind of the core thing that you're doing, um, having a language which is very like data driven felt really natural. There's also kind of in, in tandem with this, this kind of growing recognition of deep thought in the design of closure. Um, where you just get the sense as you sort of dig in that everything had really been carefully thought out and all these pieces um, had, had really carefully been put together towards something that would be a really high leverage uh, and composable tool. Um, and, and this word leverage here is one that really sticks out to me, right? Like this, when I, when I think about closure, I think about leverage. Um, and composability is a big one too. I think the composability is what gives us this leverage, um, but, but the leverage is actually the thing that we care about as practitioners, right? We want to be able to, with a very small amount of force, accomplish a lot. And, and I think that's one of the things that, that this collectively gives us. So I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, also express some of the challenges that I feel like we had over the course of the project. Um, and again, probably this is kind of a retrospective and sort of looking back and, and thinking about what, was, what went well and what, was, um, what we had to learn from. Um, I think the biggest of this was just that, you know, anytime you're working with a new language or a new sort of system, there's going to be sort of challenges. And I mean, basically, you build some stuff, you learn a lot, and then you look back and realize how badly you built stuff and how you might have done things differently. Um, and you know, I, think, I, I don't think this is necessarily anything specifically on closure. I think this is more just you know, when you learn a new language, this is kind of something that's bound to happen. You're, you're learning these new p patterns and, um, and methods for doing things. And um, uh, this is also kind of a hedge if anyone goes to look at my old code that you know, some of it might be six years old now. So don't, uh, don't judge it too harshly. But, um, uh, some other issues kind of come down to specific libraries or frameworks that we thought would be really useful and that we'd be able to leverage that turned out not to be as, um, as, as great as, as, uh, as we found. So one of these was Encanter, um, which is a really ambitious project that um, sought to sort of implement a lot of the kind of stats and um, uh, data visualization functionality that uh, I was used to working with R. Um, but unfortunately, at a certain point in its development, it kind of slowed and stalled, and it wasn't, you know, they weren't releasing new updates, and we were having problems with dependencies and such. Um, there were also broken routines, like the PCA routine for a long time was broken, it took a while to get that fixed. I think it's, they've maybe finally fixed it now, but, um, but also their website's still not up to date, and so you don't, it's, it's really hard to kind of figure out what's going on where. Um, but another issue here was just the limited graphing. Um, they did have some graphing routines, but they were sort of very primitive. And you, you know, in the, in the um, I'll talk more about this later. But in the R world, there's a really wonderful library called ggplot2, um, which uh, which I'd grown accustomed to, and it's just very powerful. And the kind of stuff you can do with it is very extensive. And um, I really missed that in in this ecosystem. So there were some pain points along the way with that. Um, and eventually, I mean, we kind of moved off that and sort of. Um, you know, we implemented our own a, um, PCA routines and, um, and uh, you know, had to, had to go, go some different directions there. Uh, 
Um, another thing that we thought was going to be really useful to us that turned out to be kind of more trouble than it was worth uh, was Storm. So this was actually one of the initial reasons that we sort of went in this direction. We saw, oh, Storm's this really cool, like, you know, big data stream processing library uh, that's actually written in Clojure, or at least initially was, and then kind of more, more in the JavaScript direction, and, or sorry, Java, Java direction. Um, and unfortunately here, we just had all these issues with the ahead of time compiling and, um, and dependency issues. And as the development on the project slowed, as it became an Apache contribution project, um, we found that the docs were out of date and they were focusing more on the Java API than the Clojure API. And so it was really hard to figure out how you were actually supposed to do things now um, when, when, when versions would update. Um, and uh, so ultimately, we just dropped this. We realized that we didn't really need it yet and um, that it was just kind of adding more trouble than it was worth. So, um, so that was, that was uh, a bit of learning along the way. Another thing here was that, um, and again, kind of this is sort of a ahead of time compile issue um, and, and the way that things were running uh, on the Heroku platform, which is what we used initially to deploy this. Um, we found that uh, you know, just starting up database connections kind of inline in um, you know, a def form um, had problems when we were deploying. And so we looked towards Stuart CR components to kind of separate the, the structure of the computations from the, the execution of the startup routine. Um, and so you know, I, I actually really like the design of Stuart Sierra's system components. Um, I think it's a simple lo solution to the problem. And I really like the, the idea of the system as a value. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, the process of sort of taking code that had already been written and porting it over was really painful and took a very long time. And you know, it's time that we could have spent working on features and other, other development. Um, and another sort of side of this is that it really makes interactive REPL development a lot more painful. Uh, instead of being able to just kind of start hacking away uh, in a file and executing some forms using whatever kind of um, in, in editor uh, REPL connection you have, and in my case I use Vim and Vim Fireplace, um, we had to sort of have these little workbench chunks of code where you'd start the system and then like get the system component you need and then pass that into the function that you wanted to test out. And it was just a lot less sort of fluid of a development experience than just being able to do this stuff in whatever namespace file you were sort of developing and tinkering with at the time. Um, so uh, that's, those are some six kind of the pain points here, but um, fortunately there's a silver lining. Again, I probably wouldn't be here if, uh, if this was all pain points. So um, to move along with that, um, there are now some alternatives to uh, the sort of traditional Stuart Sierra system components. Um, one of these is Mount, which uh, is sort of a really elegant approach and has a really, uh, I think, very friendly API um, and solves a lot of the same problems. You, you do miss out on some of the value of the, the system as a value thing, um, but ultimately uh, in other applications I've worked on now since then, it's, it's been a really a much more of a pleasure to work with. And so that's one thing to consider. Um, there's also a library called Integrant, which um, has a very kind of different take on this problem uh, and is really interesting. So um, depending on what kind of, um, what kind of tool you're building, uh, whether it's a library or an application, um, you know, these are some other alternatives that you can consider. Um, additionally, uh, since uh, I mean, a lot of this stuff has actually been pretty recent, but um, there's been sort of this growing trend of, I think, other, other folks getting into closure for, for data science and machine learning and such. And we now have a number of neural net libraries. And actually, I see Karen Meyer out here. She's been working on um, Clojure MXNet, which is, um, which is a closure sort of API for the MXNet library. Um, there's also Cortex um, from Mike Anderson, Flame from Aria, and there's a closure, there are closure bindings for the Deep Learning for J library. Um, so again, a lot of the, some of this is just taking advantage of the, the JVM ecosystem, right? Um, but the fact that there's so much attention being paid to this, is, I think, is a really positive sign that, uh, that the closure ecosystem and community are kind of moving in this direction. Um, there's some other really great libraries that have come up recently. Um, Kixi Stats has some really great work that kind of fills in some of the niches that, uh, that we saw uh, in Cantor potentially um, so, uh, having, having solved for us. There's also the Anglican probabilistic programming language, which is, which is really cool, um, especially if you're into Bayesian statistics. Um, finally, the core.matrix library uh, was kind of what we ended up um, leveraging when we moved away from uh, Encanter. We just went kind of directly for this core.matrix library and implementing these, um, these various routines ourselves. And one of the really nice things about this is that um, the core.matrix uh, um, implementation is such that 
a lot of the machinery is defined around protocols. And um, this is you know, another one of these design features of Clojure, which you know, I think affords us a lot of really high leverage, uh, in that you can actually write all this kind of general matrix code and swap out the underlying implementations. So depending on what kind of work you're doing and whether you need uh, more performance or whatever, um, it can, in a lot of cases, just be one line of code change to switch from one implementation to another and things just kind of seamlessly work. Now that even said, there's some caveats with this, right? And um, I'll, I, I point down here to um, Neanderthal because it's, um, it's uh, a more sort of low level approach to matrix uh, work in enclosure. Um, and is more sort of closely tied to some of the, the underlying like BLAS and um, um, linear algebra pack um, routines. And so if you're looking for something kind of more bare metal performance, um, Neanderthal is a good approach for that. Um, there's actually, again, though, one of the great things about Cordon Matrix is because it's so abstract, you could actually, um, and people have been working on this, you can actually implement uh, the Cordon Matrix protocol, protocols on top of Neanderthal. Um, and there's some potential issues with this. Um, if the protocols, it's possible for the protocols to sort of be leaky as far as performance uh, considerations go. So, you know, you kind of have to be a little bit careful here if, if you're going the core dot matrix route. But, um, but it's nice to know that when you need it, there's, there's some folks here who are working on um, some libraries for doing more kind of low level um, high performance uh, work with Clojure. Another thing that I think was, has been really a surprise to me that I didn't, I didn't really foresee coming was that um, the ClojureScript uh, ecosystem has been just amazing. Um, and you know, I had, some, um, I had some initial skepticism here. I wasn't sure that it would really be possible to build sort of a, a mock of Clojure uh, on such a different runtime as JavaScript and have it actually be something that didn't feel like a pain in the butt. Um, but once I tried it, I was really blown away. I mean, it was amazing to me that most of the kind of core language features uh, were exactly the same. And so now with, um, with CLJC, we can write closure code that either runs on the JVM or closure script and you know, with, with the ability to change just the little bits that, that are different here and there. Um, and, and this has been really wonderful. Um, there's some really excellent tooling here. Um, I'm particularly, you know, use FigWheel, Reagent, and Reframe. Um, but uh, uh, these, these libraries collectively really knock the socks off of working with vanilla React applications. Um, and I've done, a, I've done a bit of this now, both in, in vanilla React and with Reagent and Reframe. And, um, and I can say that you know, things just move so much more smoothly in, in the closure script world. So this has been, this has been a real joy um, and, and a pleasure. Um, uh, another sort of side of this is uh, data visualization. So um, I mentioned that Encantor had sort of let me down on the data visualization side. Um, but recently, I've um, sort of taken a second look at uh, Vega and Vega Lite. Vega has actually been around for a while. I think Vega Lite has too. But just within the last year or so, um, Vega Lite sort of released a new version that solved a lot of these old issues with, um, with their initial implementation, their old architecture. And, um, and I've really been blown away with it. Um, so it's based on, these are JavaScript libraries, and so they run in the browser. Um, but they're based on the same grammar of graphics idea that the ggplot library I mentioned uh, is based on. And um, the idea here is you have this grammar of graphics which tells you at a very high level how do you translate properties of the data that you're working with into uh, aesthetic attributes of your data visualization. So I want to color by this variable or this property. I want to uh, make the shape correspond to this property, et cetera. Um, it's really easy to do this at the high level and not be monkeying around with a bunch of imperative code. Um, but it also comes with a grammar of interaction, which lets you do really powerful things like you know, select a bunch of points in a brush selection and then have that update some other part of the visualization. Um, and part of this is that it has a complete data flow specification which, which facilitates this, which is really, really amazing. But what's really cool is that all of this is specified just as simple d JSON data. Right? The, 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 it's just a pure data JSON API, um, which is really amazing. Because what this means is you can take that JSON and you can pass it from one process to another. So I can write Vega and Vega Lite code in Clojure, Clojure script um, as Eden, and translate it over to JSON and send that over a, rep or a, a socket to, um, to, to Vega or Vega Lite in the browser and have it render that data. And, and this is really powerful, I think. Um, and really goes conceptually hand in hand with Clojure's data-driven philosophy. Um, so I'm running a little short here, so I'm going to skip through a little bit of this. But um, Vega is really super powerful and customizable, but it's not super well suited for day-to-day -day use. Um, 
Vega Light, just to kind of be clear about what each of these kind of does and what it solves, is sort of a higher level version of this that really is better for day-to-day -day usage, but still very highly leverageable. Um, and, and in particular, where, where it differs from, from Vega, it tends to be in a direction that gives you a lot of flexibility for day-to-day -day usage. Um, and finally here, um, I've been working on a little library uh, called Oz, which lets you um, create Vega and Vega Lite um, specifications on the, the Clojure REPL um, or, or in a Clojure application and then um, send those over a WebSocket to, uh, to a browser and for visualization. Um, it can also handle hiccup so that you can create sort of notebook or document-like um, uh, dashboards uh, and, and have, have sort of more control over, over things that way. Um, and uh, finally, it's got a reagent component API so that if you want to be doing kind of dynamic front end work with this stuff, you can, you can be doing that as well. Um, so if you're, if you're interested, please check that out. Um, there's also a couple of talks here linked to if you go to the, the, um, the GitHub page here, um, one of which is from the Interactive Data Lab folks in Seattle who, who built Vega and Vega Lite, and another is from um, a recent talk that I did at a Seattle Closure meetup. Um, so closing case here, Closure for Data Science. Um, there's really, what I, what I see here is a unique intersection of strengths, right? Um, the data-driven functional philosophy, um, concurrency, parallelism, distributed computing, these are all real strengths of the closure ecosystem. This growing sort of trend in the direction of machine learning um, is, is really promising. Um, and the fact that we actually have a robust front-end target. Um, I don't know of, I mean, someone can, can pick some bones with me on this uh, after the talk, but uh, I don't know of another language that's as well positioned to do both kind of the, the core work of data science and machine learning that can also do interactive data visualizations or, or web applications on the front end. Um, this is really kind of a unique positioning for, for Clojure and ClojureScript. Um, and finally, I think there's a growing community. Um, I hear feels felt like a number of years ago, um, you know, there are folks doing kind of big data processing and such, but um, often folks wouldn't be talking about that as much in terms of data science. And now I see more and more that a lot of the, 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 the companies that are using Clojure are, are, doing, are doing data science work with it. And so I think that that's, um, that's, that's a really promising trend. Um, finally, last note here is that um, Polis is open source software. We realized early on that the civic tech community was not going to embrace this if they couldn't sort of see transparency in it. And actually, you don't want uh, code in your government where you don't really know what's going on and what it's doing. And so the fact that this is open source, I think, is, um, is a real strength uh, that we have. Um, but also, what that means is, you know, if, you're, if this is exciting to you, this is sort of like piqued your interest, um, and you'd like to contribute in some way or another, um, please feel free to, uh, to get in touch. And that is all I have. Thank you.